comments to three minutes. You'll see a small countdown clock on your screen to help guide you, and our staff will notify you when your time has concluded. Third, as you logged in, you were automatically placed on mute. Once you are called on to speak, please unmute your line, start your video, and state your name before providing comments. Fourth, if you would like to submit written comments, which we also encourage, you can send them to artist at indian.senate.gov. That's artist at indian.senate.gov. This email address is in the chat for your reference. We will be accepting written comments until May 19th. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that today's listening session is a bipartisan effort. So I'll return to staff to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Brianne Uhiva and I serve as Deputy Staff Director for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, my name is Lena Aoki and I serve as General Counsel. Yeah, my name is Connie Sozi Deharo and I serve as Counsel for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, everybody. My name is Darren Modulski and I serve as Policy Advisor for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, my name is Manu Tupper and I serve as Legislative Assistant and Press Secretary for Chairman Schatz on the committee. Hello, my name is Amber Ebarb and I serve as Staff Director for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Hello, my name is Lucy Murfitt and I serve as Chief Counsel for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Basili and I serve as Policy Advisor and Press Secretary for Vice Chairman Murkowski on the committee. With that, we will begin the listening session. If you'd like to offer comments, there are a couple ways to do so. Please use the raise hand feature in your WebEx meeting window. Second, if you are calling by phone, please text 202-308-2297 with your name and organization. To repeat, that number is 202-308-2297. We will recognize speakers in chronological order. As a reminder, please state your name before you begin. We are grateful for your participation and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Dr. Norwood, please unmute and proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'd like to thank uh, Senator Schatz, Senator Bukowski, the members of the committee and staff for the opportunity to make brief comments. Uh, I am uh, a citizen of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation and also the General Secretary of the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes, known by the acronym ASET. Uh, the organization I represent has had the opportunity to review the draft legislation, and uh, along with the century-old Association on American Indian Affairs, ASET has submitted joint written comments to the committee earlier this month. The Indian Arts and Craft Act provides important protections to both American Indian artisans and to consumers seeking to purchase authentic American Indian arts and crafts by regulating who can label their work as genuine and by penalizing those who create inauthentic products. Enhancing enforcement of the act is in the best interest of tribal artisans and the general public. To that end, ASEP fully supports the intent and the proposed language of the bill and the effort to include the protections and benefits of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act to Native Hawaiians. It must also be mentioned that Indian Arts, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act has served as the gold standard uh, regarding its inclusion of both federally recognized tribes and tribes recognized by the government of their state. In so doing, the act is consistent with other federal protections and benefits extended to state recognized tribes and their citizens, assisting in the preservation and promotion of the artistry and economy of tribal communities. Similar to the state recognized tribal nations that are a part of ASEP, uh, which also includes federal tribes, many state recognized tribes have a documented continuing history within their states, often stemming from a relationship with the colonial government prior to the ratifying of the United States Constitution. Yet even with tribal history that includes colonial or state reservations or documented Indian towns, treaties and land grants, historically recognized tribally run schools, enrollment in federal funded boarding schools, and the identification of tribal ancestors in government records, there are still historical 
historically verifiable tribes which are not included in the BIA list of federally recognized tribes, their absence from that list being due to an error that is yet to be corrected by the federal government. The reality is that the Department of Interior or legislative recognition can be long delayed. ASET includes tribes whose official status has changed from state recognized to federally recognized only after decades of fighting for that status. There are years in which the Indian Arts and Crafts Act has protected and promoted traditional artists of tribal or arts of tribal citizens who possess the same connection to their culture, whether or not their tribe was placed on the BIA list of federally recognized tribes. Generations of artisans from such tribes have made worthy contributions to the continuation of their culture within the fabric of America. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act upholds the value of that continuing contribution. Any update to the act should remain inclusive of such artisans, as it also is extended to Native Hawaiians. Additionally, we ask the committee's consideration regarding the way in which some tribal artisans who are protected under the act have their rights violated in some venues because they were not citizens of federally recognized tribes but were from state recognized tribes. Enforcement of the act should not only address the issue of non-native artisans and retailers who violate the act but also ensure that all eligible artisans receive equal protection of their arts and crafts and their sale of such items as American Indian made. Articles 3, 20, and 31 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples upholds the right of all indigenous people to celebrate their culture and have their cultural expressions protected, including Native Hawaiians into the Indian Arts and Crafts Act that already protects artisans from federal and state tribes is consistent with the intent of this declaration and ace. Thank you, Dr. Norwood. We appreciate your comments. Out of respect for the other panelists, we have to move on to the next. Principal Chief Hoskins. Would you please proceed and unmute? Well, I thank the committee. I thank uh, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Chairperson Murkowski, and of course the staff uh, for their time and attention to this issue. I'm Chuck Hoskin, Jr., Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. It's my honor to serve as Chief of the Cherokee Nation, the largest tribe in the United States. Uh, among our tribal citizens are many artists, artisans, and craft people who uh, perpetuate Cherokee culture through their art. Uh, I applaud the desire to strengthen the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. It's an important law, and it's one that we uh, must regularly examine uh, in order to protect Native American artists and to protect consumers. It is a truth in advertising law, and it is one that is important for the country. Uh, I cannot, however, support the Artist Act in its current form because it fails to address what federally recognized tribes and artists from federally recognized tribes have long called for, which is the inclusion of state recognized tribes. Now the current statute defines Indian and Indian tribes far too broadly. It extends protections to members of state recognized tribes. I want to be plain, I want to be clear, state recognized tribes are not Indian tribes. And a member of one of these organizations are not Indian tribes, are not citizens of Indian nations. So the most important change that Congress can make and should make uh, in the next uh, iteration of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is to narrow the definition of Indian and Indian tribes so that it ensures that works are only uh, covered uh, if they are produced by members of federally recognized tribes. Uh, you must be a member of a federally recognized tribe to be an Indian within the meaning of the act. And that, of course, is based on uh, the tribe's inherent sovereignty to determine its citizenship. And so why is this important to Indian country in general and why is it important to the Cherokee Nation? At least 10 of these uh, so-called tribes recognized by straight states falsely claim Cherokee history and culture. So under the current law, under the current, under the current Indian Arts and Crafts Act, members of these fraudulent groups, none of whom have a legitimate che claim to Cherokee culture, may produce and sell art and call these works Cherokee. So we have wonderful artists in the Cherokee Nation, and I can imagine one of our great Cherokee National Treasures uh, producing art that is something time-honored, handed down from generation to generation, frankly from generations that were at times suppressed in terms of our ability to create uh, and find a marketplace for our art, sitting alongside one of these fake tribes in a gallery or shop. It's wrong, but the federal law uh, gives a blanket of protection around those fake tribes that are competing with the actual Cherokee tribes. There are, by the way, three federally recognized Cherokee tribes, the Cherokee Nation and two bands, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians uh, in North Carolina 
and the Oklahoma-based United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians. Only citizens of these tribes can produce Cherokee arts and crafts. Uh, they own, they're the only ones that have a legitimate nexus to Cherokee culture, and yet they compete alongside these fake organizations posing as tribes, even when those organizations have some sort of uh, mix of any of the 50 different standards, if any standards exist, for state recognition. The law needs to be changed. If, it is in, if its intent is to protect those who need the protection, if it's to lift up those that need a foothold in the marketplace, if it is to protect consumers, then the law needs to be changed to narrow that definition to what really is the standard across the country with some very limited exceptions, which is that federal recognition is the standard. Uh, this is a problem that is ongoing. Often these organizations will sell membership into their organizations. Uh, it's something that needs examination by this committee. It needs correction. Indian country is not going to tolerate this. The Intertribal Council of the Five Tribes in Oklahoma, one of the largest organizations in the country representing Native Indian people, has recently called for this action. Certainly as chief of the Cherokee Nation, I have called upon our citizens to undertake a grassroots effort to affect this change. I ask committee to make this overdue change. What do? Thank you, Chief Hawkins. Keely Denning, would you please unmute and proceed? of the Cherokee Nation and the Shawnee Tribe. I would like to start White, with conferring with Chief Hoskins on this issue, that we have this issue of these non-tribes. And my example would be the Piqua Shawnee that are originally from Ohio. I'm a genealogist. This tribe, as they call themselves, left Ohio, moved down to Alabama to get state recognition down there. We've done the genealogy on members of this tribe, and they are not Indian, they are not Shawnee, and they get to sell their wares as Indian made, uh, which is a huge insult, not just to myself, but to my family, because we are Piquasep. So, with that said, um, I, I'm more than willing to share my information I have on these groups. However, the United States Constitution states that the only power over Native Americans is with Congress, the United States Congress. So why are states being allowed to recognize these groups who are not Native and cannot produce evidence of being such? So with that, um, I, will, I will give back my time, and I thank you very much. But as a genealogist and a historian, we need to get this straight for Native peoples so that we they stop treating us unfairly and taking our work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anthony Perry, would you please unmute and proceed? Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Anthony Perry, and I am an author and a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Thank you for organizing this listening session and for taking the time to listen to the voices of Native artists. I would like to request inclusion of authors among the artists protected under legislation that will supersede the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act offers no protection for books, meaning that readers are left to an author's own claims, or the claims of their publisher, about whether they are Native American. Unfortunately, there are many authors who falsely claim a Native identity, using this to differentiate themselves from their peers, and build careers that involve not only writing, but also speaking out as self-proclaimed experts on Native issues. This is a form of colonization and racial supremacy that continues the ancestral legacy that many of these authors bear. It is wrong when people whose ancestors occupied native lands now attempt to occupy native identities. These pretendian authors exploit the complexities of native identity. We are citizens of nations rather than a distinct race, and the uncertainties many have with their own, uh, and with their own native identity. Remember that for over 400 years, the American message to Native peoples was that they are savages to be civilized. The scars run deep. Protection through new legislation is essential. 
Books play a major role in shaping the way people see the world and those around them. We see this play out today as state governments seek to restrict access to books in school libraries, among other examples. This gives many authors, especially authors from marginalized communities, a sense of tremendous responsibility to tell stories that inform as well as entertain. Unfortunately, young people have limited opportunities to learn about Native Americans, the original inhabitants of the land we now call the United States. Even as America becomes more diverse, many still learn about Native Americans through what they see in films, watch on television, and read in books. We are, for many people, noble peoples of the past, or mascots for sports teams. Research by the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison found that only 1.7% of children's books published in 2022 were about Native American people. Unfortunately, not all of those books or other books published by, uh, about Native American people in years past provide an authentic voice. At the moment, gatekeepers such as publishers, awards committees, and events organizers find themselves in an awkward position of verifying Native identity. This is even more complicated when those gatekeepers aren't themselves Native and don't understand the complexities. Some, quite frankly, don't care. Legislation creates an expectation to validate Native identity and a framework through which to do this. I therefore ask your consideration of including authors in subsequent legislation to ensure that Native voices are heard and not diluted by those who seek to exploit us. Thank you. Thank you. Harry Wallace, would you please unmute and proceed? <clears throat> My name is Harry Wallace, <clears throat> excuse me. I am the chief of the Yonkichog Indian Nation. Yonkichog occupy a small territory on our original ancestral lands on Long Island in New York and have never been moved or relocated. Our people have lost a great deal and endured unspeakable traumas in order to hold on to our homeland and continue our way of life. The Uncachalk Nation is a tribe recognized by the state of New York since colonial times and is recognized under federal common law pursuant to the standards set forth under Montoya v. U.S. and Gristides v. Uncachalk Nation et al. In the Gristides case, the court, a federal district court, said that the Uncachalk are, are a tribe under the standards set forth in Montoya and that it has never abrogated or surrendered its sovereignty. As such, it is immune from prosecution. We are not, however, on the BIA list of tribes. Some of our neighboring nations have been placed on the list after spending millions of dollars in legal and consultant fees paid for by investors. We do not have millions of dollars, nor do we have such investors. What we do have is our art. The Uncachog are well known as wampum makers. The term wampum refers to the art of making beads and other items by cutting, shaping, and polishing clam and whelk shells. To us, the making of wampum is more than art. It is a spiritual yeah. connection to our ancestors. Our laws, ceremonies, history, and traditions are written and solemnized in wampum. We have never given up the art and tradition of making wampum. The Uncachog, together with a wholly native-owned company known as Wampum Magic, have promoted the development and production of wampum. We have been responsible for taking back control yeah. of wampum production from non-native manufacturers well, and making wampum accessible and affordable yeah. to native artists. Every native artist who uses wampum in their art, including yeah. some prominent Cherokee artists, knows of the Uncachog Nation and wampum magic. Some of our young people yeah. have picked up the mantle of yeah, using sure wampum in the creation of art. The the items they have created are on display in such preeminent institutions as the yeah. New York Historical Society and the Museum of the American Indian yeah. in New York City, the Chicago Fields Museum, and the New York State right. Museum, right. and the Wertheim National Wildlife Center on Long Island. All that art would instantly be declared illegal if the amendment proposed by the Cherokee Nation is adopted. Our tradition will be destroyed by someone we have no quarrel with, yet we are asked to bear the burden of their anger. This is untenable. Our distinct coastal Algonquin culture and heritage should be honored and respected, safeguarded and protected. We therefore ask that you stand up to discriminatory and exclusionary practices 
and remove those limitations proposed by the Cherokee Nation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Douglas Buchholz, would you please unmute and proceed? Douglas, are you still with us? Okay, let's move on to the next caller. Ms. Liz Wallace, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Okay, I'm here. Um, Yacht A, my name is Liz Wallace. I'm a Navajo silversmith. I'm one of the people that helped get the first ever jail time for someone violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Start my video. Okay. Um, a few years ago, and that was Nael Ali. I'm actually here to advocate for including terminated legitimate tribes from California. Even though I'm enrolled with the Navajo Nation, I was born and raised in Nishinan country. I have, I'm descended from a really famous Nishinan artist. Um, unfortunately, because the, the land and resources, gold, oil, etc., were so coveted by colonial powers, a lot of our tribe, like 30 tribes in California who had legitimate histories, ancestry that was traceable got terminated. And I think this would be very simple for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board to do. There's actually a United States Code 1679, which is eligibility of California Indians to uh, get Indian health services. So descendants and members of these terminated tribes are able to get um, services through the Indian health law. And so this is established federal Indian policy already, and it was made more permanent in 2010. Um, right now, there, there's a lot of fake tribes in California, absolutely, but um, right now, the legitimate tribal people in California who can prove their ancestry are not able to sell legally as Native American made because uh, the state of California has no state recognition process, and a lot of our traditional governments weren't all that centralized. So. Um, even three contact California tribes might not meet current BIA requirements, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. Mr. Douglas Buchholz, let's circle back to you. Are you available and ready to speak? You may need to unmute yourself. I think you have some challenges. Let's move on. Mr. Cedar Sherbert, are you ready to speak? Please unmute and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Cedar Sherbert. I'm the enrolled member of the Ipai Nation of San Isabel. I'm, we're one of the communities that make up the Kumeyaay Nation of San Diego and Northern Baja, California. Um, while bolstering enforcement of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is welcome, I'm asking you today to please consider including performing arts and literature as forms of art that are protected under IACA. Please know that my connection to this issue of cultural fraud and appropriation is deeply personal. Beginning in 2004 and leading into 2006, I was conned into adapting a memoir, quote unquote, by a supposed Navajo writer named Nas Dij into a screenplay. The two years that I was in this man's periphery were a kind of hell, really. He was not forthcoming with any degree of cultural knowledge, nor was he able to explain familial ties. He would grow defensive and violently, violently lash out when confronted with inconsistencies, threatening me with legal action and physical violence. Through the intervention of journalists at the New York Times and the LA Weekly, we were able to definitively determine that there was no Nas Dij, just a deeply troubled Anglo writer from Lansing, Michigan, by the name of Tim Barris. Um, now, please consider this. For the span of three books, Nas D. slash Barris was the preeminent Navajo writer in the world. Again, until he was outed, a white man was the most widely read Navajo writer in the world. 
Of course, we now know that he wasn't Nav native at all, but the damage was done not only to the careers of real Navajo authors, but also the general book buying public. Um, it was vast, and it could have been much worse had it been left to continue. Um, likewise, as a native media professional living in LA, I've sadly become all too familiar with performers, writers, directors, and producers who falsely claim ancestry such as Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Lakota, etc., and use these false narratives to set themselves apart and establish careers, creating misleading depictions of the communities they claim and often positioning themselves as media gatekeepers. There should be a means wherein tribes could alert the Indian Arts and Crafts Board who could then contact studios, production companies, and other media outlets, and even take legal action against these individuals. I'd also argue that visual and written media have perhaps a much wider influence within popular culture than perhaps any other cultural products. I know intimately the damage ethnic frauds do to others, both at the personal and collective levels. They have no commitment to the communities they claim, their only concern being their own personal aggrandizement and career advancement. Moreover, the Native people who are in fact from the communities these opportunists exploit do not see themselves in these works. They have reflected back at them a distorted and incorrect version of their cultures and are being falsely represented to the world at large, robbing real Indian people of agency and voice. Please know that the issue of cultural appropriation is one of growing urgency among tribal communities. It has reached epidemic proportions as a blatant and Indian country is pushing back against this tide by enacting legislation at the governmental level, condemning ethnic fraud, forming commissions to confront perpetrators of such theft, and by pushing for the bolstering, bolstering of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act to include both written and performing arts, as I am doing today. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sherbert. For those calling in, I'd like to remind you to please raise the hand feature in your WebEx meeting window if you would like to provide comments. If you are calling by phone, Please text 202-308-2297 with your name and organization. It's 202-308-2297. For those wishing to make comments, please do so in either of those two ways. Thank you, Jennifer. Mr. Douglas Buckholz, let's try you again. Are you ready to speak? Go ahead and unmute and proceed with your comments. Let's try this one more time. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Okay, good. Okay, sorry for the technical mishap. My name is Douglas Bocals. I've been studying race shifting for approximately 20 years. Uh, I am used to be president of Washington State, then of Vermont, and now I'm in Lancaster, New Hampshire for the last oh, 15 years or so. Um, there's two people I want to bring up, and there are very good reasons for this. Uh, one is Buffy St. Marie. We all know her. We've all heard about her. Um, in November, I was notified by a federally recognized researcher who is of Native descent. She's here. Her name is Jacqueline Keeler, and I very much thank her very much. I began researching the origins of Buffy St. Marie. Uh, she's in the music industry, and she is a fraud. She uh, has changed her name in 1976 to St. Marie. The public has been duped. Another one is Joseph Bouchak. Very recently, I have secured his uh, great-grandfather's uh, ancestry. He continues to claim that he is of native ancestry. He is on the Van Antwerp side in the 1600s, but on Louis Bowman, full-blood French-Canadian. Um, and this is the problem that I see with this as a non-Native person who had heard oral history in my own family that, um, you know, this Indian art, Indian stories, uh, much like uh, Anthony has, Perry has stated, uh, just like uh, Chief Hopkins has stated, uh, etc., and Kyle Denning has stated already very eloquently, there is much damage that is happening with the Indian Art and Crafts Act uh, infiltration by pretend Indians, uh, by non-natives. Um, and these, these two examples that I'm giving you are quite uh, prominent uh, within uh, financial dynamics, wherein they take and they, I don't want to swear, but uh, they con the American public. The American public, including politicians, do not understand Native history, Native identity issues, and I want to clarify this much like stolen valor. And with the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, 
along with Indian Child Welfare and NAGPRA, these people who are self-identifying as Indian have found a new angle in which to use archaeologists, anthropologists, ethnologists, and even some including uh, Native peoples within tribes, federally recognized. Um, and, you know, after studying this, of course, it's all in education, you don't learn in high school, that's for sure, uh, there is this problem and this dynamic, much like stolen valor. I would suggest to the government of the United States to cease and desist allowing state-recognized tribes to gain any protections under any of these federal laws, including Indian arts and crafts, because it is extremely dangerous to the, I hate to use the English terminology, the sovereignty of federally recognized tribes. Uh, it's, it's incremental and it's pervasive across the U.S. and Canada, as Daryl LaRue has stated and has investigated himself. Um, and so that's what I'll do, that's what I'll say. Uh, again, you know, we have two people, Sophie St. Marie, as we call her today, who was known as Santa Maria at her birth at 315 in Stone, Massachusetts, and Joseph Bruce. Thank you, sir. Fortunately, we have to move along to the next presenter. Uh, Mr. Patrick Suarez, would you please proceed with your comments? Go ahead and unmute. Hello, um, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm picking up my kids, so I got four kids. Um, my name is Patrick, I'm from the Maharan tribe here in North Carolina. And um, I just wanted to say, I'm not as formal as the rest of the speakers, but here in North Carolina and Virginia, we were, we were the ones that were first contacted. So we have a lot of uh, ties with one another. Um, the six tribes in Virginia just got recognized through Congress. Um, we have a lot of ties with the Nazmin, with the, uh, the Pamunkey people. It's hard for us state-recognized tribes here in North Carolina to get federal recognized due to the fact many of our courts were burned down and a lot of the records. However, our people are the same. We have strong connections, genealogy, DNA testing to the federal recognized tribes. As, as Mr. Wallace mentioned prior. However, a lot of our artists here in North Carolina are welcomed by other federal recognized tribes with our arts and crafts. Um, for instance, Miss, Miss Lynch, Sonora Lynch, she's a well-known um, pottery maker. She goes everywhere. And even our Cherokee brothers here in North Carolina, they welcome us sometimes to their events. Not saying all, like their powwow, they're, they're coming up. But in North Carolina, we have a commission of Indian Affairs, and our standards for to get recognized are at par as most federal uh, with the BIA rules and regulations. It's basically the same standards that the BIA are, are requesting as what we have here at the Commission of Indian Affairs in North Carolina. And I would like to say that, you know, our people here in North Carolina and Virginia, the ones that just got state recognized, um, you know, we, we are native and that's not going to change. And I appreciate the time that you're giving me um, on this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jacqueline Keeler, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Um, yes. Um, I'd like to thank the Senate Committee on Native Affairs for this opportunity to provide comments. My name is Jacqueline Keeler, and I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation, and I am born for the Yankton Sioux Tribe. And um, I'm very glad to see this committee's focus on improving the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, originally passed in 1935, a truth and advertising law. Um, I'm sure American artists will greatly appreciate any amendments that will allow for the increased enforcement of the law. However, I believe increasing the scope of the law is of equal importance in today's marketing environment, as I've been told by Native artists, and have also reviewed myself. I, I created a list uh, a couple of years ago uh, called the Alleged Pretendians List of about 200 um, suspected and already proven um, ethnic frauds. And we reviewed the list of the family trees of those suspected ethnic frauds and found that 97% of them were unverifiable as Native people. Only three of them were adoptees. 
And so when we started the list, we thought that it, the issue was mostly distant ancestry. But what we have found is that it's actual absolute fraud that's going on. And other studies have supported this finding, um, including research into uh, box checking for colleges and universities, which is extremely high. <clears throat> so uh, part of the issue is that <laughs> these um, false claims to native identity, um, you know, many of them are based on this uh, idea of sort of a <laughs> self-identification, which is not an acceptable level of proof for any other nationality. And Native people are citizens of nations, not simply um, racial groups. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, a person can be of any perceived race and be a citizen of a nation. And, um, and so research and verification of claims is, from what I found, absolutely necessary to, to, to be able to address this issue. Um, what I'd like to address right now is the issue of false claims of Native identity in publishing and the performing arts, which I think are of equal concern to the protection of Native culture, perspective, and as a marketing tool to increase the authenticity of the author's perspective to prospective purchasers of books, plays, screenplays, and poetry written by alleged American authors. And, um, and this all falls under marketing because these are all listed in the marketing materials of publishers of um, film production companies, you know, the, the native identity is a marketing tool. And so I believe falls within the scope of the, uh, the original scope and intent of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, you know, the issues of fraud have been ongoing. Um, uh, <laughs> Cedar Sherbert just mentioned what happened to him in 2006 when, uh, you know, the um, Nas Dij, the fake uh, European American named Timothy Barris, uh, falsely claimed to be a Navajo writer. I am, of course, a Navajo citizen, and most Navajos, 90%, are full bloods, and we're about 400,000 tribal members, and, um, and certainly have a perspective that Americans would love to learn more about, um, not simply performed in red face by white um, sort of <laughs> interpreters of our, of our experiences. If you go back to 1972, Jaime Esther Storm, who was also on the alleged pretendian list, um, you know, his book, Seven Arrows, was actually challenged. His publisher, Harper and Rowe, was challenged by the Cheyenne Nation, and they received the promise that they would stop publishing the book as a book of nonfiction, but as fiction. Yet it still is interpreted and understood to this day. Uh, you know, you can look up essays written by students who believe that he is an actual Cheyenne man when he is actually uh, not Cheyenne at all. Thank you so much. We really appreciate those comments. Uh, just as a friendly reminder, we we'll want you all to remain muted until you are ready to speak. And we'd like to encourage uh, any, any further discussion. Please use the raise hand feature in the WebEx meeting window to be uh, recognized and called upon. Thank you. For those who have called in, if you would like to provide comments, please unmute yourself and we will recognize you. Please limit your comments to three minutes so everyone can have a chance to speak. Again, the number is At the moment, we don't have any callers who seek to be recognized. Oh, we have one that came in. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Ms. Wanda Burns Ramsey, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Wanda Burns Ramsey, a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina and president of the Triangle Native American, American Society. The Triangle is an organization, an urban Indian organization that was formed in 1984 to promote and protect the identity of Native Americans living in Wake, Johnston, Durham, Orange, and Chatham counties of North Carolina by providing educational, social, and cultural programs. 
Since its inception, the triangle has endeavored to promote and protect the Native American identity by increasing the public's awareness of the cultural and economic contributions made by Native Americans and enhancing the public recognition of the needs of American Indians. We do not support the exclusion of state recognized Indians and Indian tribes from the American Indian Arts and Crafts Act. The rights of state recognized tribes must be protected. In 1985, the Lumbee tribe was recognized as an Indian by the state of North Carolina. In 1956, Congress passed the Lumbee Act, which recognized the tribe as Indian, but at the same time excluded us from equal rights and benefits as our other federally recognized Indian brothers and sisters, which is uh, something we are still working to correct. And uh, here we are today, you know, faced with this bill. On behalf of the members of the Triangle Native American Society, we officially oppose the exclusion of state recognized Indians from the Artisan Act of 2023. We ask that you, as our representatives to the United States Congress, respect and preserve the rights of state recognized Indians in this bill and at all levels of the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sarah Mix, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Ocio, I'm a member as well as my first cousin here residing in Ashland, Oregon. We are citizens of Cherokee Nation. Our Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. has spoken. We concur. We concur with Jacqueline Keeler. We concur with Cedar Sherbert. We concur with Douglas Buchholz. We concur with the parties that are investigating and responsible for being our allies and also federally recognized tribal citizens or members. We have here in the, this town where we're living a totem pole is made by a non-native person claiming to be Anishinaabe. We have a canoe here that was made by someone who claimed to be Cherokee who has never been Cherokee but is still selling art as Northwestern art here in the Northwest of America. These kind of relationships that interfere with other tribal, cultural, important, sometimes religious and ceremonial artifacts or make, make made up artifacts cause problems and they make tropes that are impacting generation after generation. They are also impacting this town because there's also a bronze of a person who claimed to be Comanche here. So there's actually no one from this locale of where we are who has any expression of art here in this town. And it, I've come to the conclusion that it is a very serious matter. And as we are over 70 years old and we've seen a few things go on throughout our lives, we respect the generations now that are coming forth and we also concur with Anthony Perry who's Chickasaw um, and the folks who are responsible including my most respected one of my most respected families in Cherokee Nation and the Katuas uh, David Cornsilk Wado thank you so much Ms. Peggy Fontenot, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Hello, <clears throat> my name is Peggy Fontenot, 
In looking over the proposed changes to the Artist Act of 2023, nothing concerns me because I don't see language affecting state-recognized tribes. With that said, as you are aware, there is an ongoing push by Chief Hoskin of the Cherokee Nation to eliminate state-recognized tribes from the Indian Arts and Crafts Act while also campaigning against congressional recognition. In 2016, I sued the state of Oklahoma when they passed Cherokee-authored House Bill 2261, which updated Oklahoma's 1974 American Indian Arts and Crafts Sales Act, allowing only members of federally recognized tribes to sell their art as native made in the state of Oklahoma, thus eliminating state recognized tribal artists. In 2019, a federal judge ruled that the law was contrary to the federal act and that the law was in violation of the act, thus ruling it null and void. In the Cherokee tribe's unsuccessful attempts to affect the laws in Oklahoma, Principal Chief Hoskins' solution is to change the federal law. During her court deposition dated October 25, 2017, Cherokee Nation expert witness Kendessa Tihi testified that she was unaware of the standards in which the Cherokee used to determine if a state-recognized tribe is fake. She testified that the Cherokee's focus is on Cherokee groups they believe to be fake. She indicated that she was unaware of other tribal histories and that the Cherokee had not yet made, yet made a determination about the Patawomic tribe of which I am a member. She testified that it's okay for a state-recognized tribe to truthfully call itself an American Indian tribe while petitioning for federal recognition. She also testified that an individual may meet the condition for indigeneity and may be considered American Indian prior to the tribe having gained federal recognition. This affirmation negates Mr. Hoskins' own arguments that state-recognized tribes are fake. An additional example contrary to Mr. Hoskins' argument that state-recognized tribes <clears throat> and their artists are fake is the case of the Pamunkey tribe who gained federal recognition in 2015. If Chief Hoskins' arguments were true, the Pamunkey would be fake Indians one day and real Indians the next, which is not plausible. Removing state tribes and artists from the act will bring additional issues. It will call into question the value and validity of state-recognized Native art that collectors and consumers have purchased and is now widely circulated. Thank you for those comments. Out of respect for the other panelists, we need to move on to the next speaker. Ms. Candice Lowry, would you please unmute and proceed? Ms. Lowry, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I'm here with um, Mr. Greg Richardson. He's going to speak on the, our behalf. Please proceed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Richardson. and I am, I am the Executive Director of the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, here in North Carolina, we have eight tribes. Uh, one of those tribes the Eastern Band of Cherokee is federally recognized, and we have seven state-recognized tribes. Uh, here in North Carolina, we have state recognition procedures that are created through and in combination with our Indian Commission and the state's administrative rulemaking process. We have never in this state recognized another tribe that has federal status. It's my hope that we would never do that because I understand what the argument is when states recognize tribes that already hold federal status, that creates quite a, a scenario that 
causes other problems. So here in North Carolina, I just wanted to say to you that we are uh, opposed to any efforts to remove uh, state-recognized Indians from the Arts and Crafts Act. And we feel that by doing so would be discriminatory and would leave with leaving out a good portion of the United States American Indian population. The Arts and Crafts Act was created in 1935, and there was good intentions for the creation of that act, but also things have changed quite a bit in the United States throughout these years and decades. What we knew in 1935, we know a lot more now in 2023 than we knew in 1935. So if we are to uh, proceed uh, with a future in our United States in terms of leading out a portion of our population after so many generations of being left out, I think we'd be doing an injustice to all American Indians in the United States. Here in North Carolina, we have American Indian artists and craftsmen that are highly recognized throughout the United States and abroad because of the good quality of their work. I don't know a single state-recognized Indian artist that has ever portrayed their work to represent a federally recognized tribe. So we find that the uh, position the tribes are taking against the state-recognized tribe to be tremendously uh, offensive uh, and also discriminatory. So thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. It's an honor to be in your presence, and I hope that the uh, efforts moving forward would not be an effort to uh, remove state-recognized Indians from an, an opportunity to participate in the arts and crafts work moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Really appreciate it. Kathy White. Would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Hello, my name is Kathy White. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and have been doing genealogy for over 25 years. I would like to tell all those people who are talking about this act having state tribes in it. This act never had state tribes in it until 1990. That was when David Cornsilt and several other people updated this act, and right before it was closing, Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell added an amendment adding state tribes. As it turns out, Ben Nighthorse Campbell is not native. He is a fake native. His genealogy has been done and has been proven that he is not real. So, for all of those who are complaining about it, they need to go back and look and see why it was added. It was added by, I say, mistake and should not be in there anymore. It should be removed. I agree with our Chief Chuck Hoskins, and I would like to see this error made by Midnight Horse Campbell fixed in my lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Joe Candilo, did you have any comments? Please unmute and proceed. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir, please go ahead. My name is Dr. Joe Candillo, and I'm a tribal citizen of the Pasquayaki tribe of Arizona. I own and operate a business called Authentic Native American Traditional Arts from which I make and sell high-end, authentically made, traditionally Native American material culture. I've been professionally immersed in the American Indian arts and crafts market for well over 20 years now, and, though, and through my involvement, I've gained considerable insight specifically in areas where fraud is occurring today. Suffice it to say, such frauds continue to negatively impact legitimate Native American communities, artists, and Native art businesses like the one I operate. I live in the eastern part of the United States for most of my life. While living in this area, I've noticed the, an increased in people who self-identify as Native American coming together, incorporating as a 501c3 nonprofit Native American tribe 
More often than not, these people casually come together under no formal legitimate genealogical criteria to determine if the group members actually have Native American ancestry or historically based tribal affiliations. Often these groups eventually befriend a state politician seeking more formal state recognition, promising the state official constituency in addition to federal funds for minorities. If the politician pushes through state legislation, which will more formally recognize these groups as official Native American tribes. I will refer to these groups from this point on as CPANs, or corporations posing as indigenous nations. As mentioned above, these groups rarely, if ever, actually vet their members looking into the genealogies to ensure that they are indeed legitimate Native American ancestors or have ancestry. Furthermore, some states often require little to no proof showing that members are of the C. Paines are actually legitimate Native peoples or tribes. After formal state recognition is acquired, it's my understanding that the C. Payne often siphons money off of governmental programs through an assortment of federal programs, including the Department of Economics, often redirecting funds away from legitimate minority disadvantaged communities and into their supposed tribal communities for their group members. In addition, individual C. Payne members also apply to grants meant for Native American artists and often open businesses under minority statuses applying and often getting awarded state work contracts that have a minority preference, sometimes worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Members of CPAIN groups who often state or recognize or gain that recognition operate fraudulently under the protections of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act as it's currently worded. Um, within these groups, many times have no Native American ancestry again. Through genealogical platforms av available today and through tribal records, Native American ancestry, citizenship, and or heritage is often provable. Uh, often tribal members of federally recognized nations are held to a stricter criteria, criteria to qualify as Native American citizens by their respective nations. Simply put, state recognition can enable fraud allowing non-Native artists to create Native American made art of which severely ne negatively impacts real Native American artists today. I am in full agreement that there are some legitimate state uh, recognized tribes out there today, uh, but those that are legitimate uh, are having to bear the repercussions of those that are not. Uh, I strongly suggest that, the FET, that there's a federal vetting process and measures that be that could be taken to ensure that specific state recognized members actually have legitimate Native American ancestry and thus have the right to market their arts as authentically Native American made. To people who are legitimate or of legitimate Native American ancestry, such processes should not be threatening at all or any way. And I also would uh, like to see the uh, protections of the Indian Arts and Crafts expand to authorship and also performing arts. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those comments. Just as a reminder, uh, we don't have anyone else in the queue. So if you would like to jump in on the discussion and participate, if you're in the WebEx meeting window, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, wait to be called on and recognized, and then we will get you all, uh, get your comments. If you have dialed in and you would like to speak, please text the 202-308-2297, and we'll call and recognize you for your comments as well. Thank you. Barbara Blankenbaker, would you please unmute and proceed? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Barbara Blankenbaker. I am a proud member of the Potawatomi Indian Tribe of Virginia. The laws will be strengthened when the Artist Act is passed. I am glad the focus of the Act is on strengthening the laws and educational efforts for our protection. I wholeheartedly support the bill as written. I humbly request that you consider what it means to be proud of the artistic work that we do as Native Americans and that you continue to allow our right to pass this on to future generations. There are Native Americans in both state and federally recognized tribes who depend on the income earned from their arts and crafts to support their families and extended families. I do not support the, the proposed amendment of excluding state tribes. It would only serve to disempower those who are proud members of state tribes and their families. The state recognized tribes should not be punished because of non-Natives who make bad choices. In addition, I did not see where the proposed amendment of state tribe exclusion will help in ceasing the misrepresentation of Native American artwork. I believe our ancestors would want us to be united in working together to strengthen the laws 
that would prohibit those who illegally present artwork as Native American made. I believe that an appropriate resolution lies in educating the public and strengthening the laws. Thank you for this. And also, I would uh, request that you expand it to authorship as well. I'm an author and an artist. And um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Charlie Mato Toyella, would you please unmute and proceed? Hi, my name is Charlie Mato Toyella. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Just want to make sure I wasn't having any mic problems there. Uh, first, I uh, thank the committee for having me here. That does uh, offer me a great honor, and I appreciate it. Also, I'd like to, in order, thank uh, Reverend Dr. Norwood. I greatly appreciate your words. They're very uh, powerful and appreciated. And Peggy Fontenot, as well as BIA Representative Gregory Richardson. Thank you all very much. Uh, Barbara, you were the last one here that uh, spoke. I appreciate you very much for speaking up for us small state-recognized tribes. Joe uh, Candio, I didn't expect to thank you, but I really do. I was very moved by your verbiage. I appreciate it, and I, of everyone that I've heard, I would certainly go along with your interpretation that each of us should be judged based on our authenticity and from there uh, determine whether or not we are a Native artist or not. Uh, I am currently a member of the state-recognized tribe, uh, the Cherokee Aniwea, which is in Alabama. My father was born in Marshall County, which is where the bulk of the tribe is from and resides today. Uh, a lot of times I think that if uh, you asked anybody in Alabama if they had a member of their family that was a uh, you know, Native American or what have you, you always hear that their grandmother was a Cherokee Indian. That's uh, not an uncommon thing and for obvious reasons. Uh, the town of Guntersville is where my father's from, which is named after John Gunter, whose family was the prominent Cherokee Indians in the area, previously known as the Creek Path. It is the site from the first Native American boarding school that was put here in the United States, was in Guntersville, Alabama. It's also where the chief of the Cherokees, Chief Bushyhead, was from, who was one of the earlier chiefs who has a prominent and very important historical reverence. That having been said, the amendment to respect traditional indigenous skills and talent has gotten a great deal of notice, likewise, uh, excuse me, leastwise for allowing the Native Hawaiians to be considered as Native artists. Uh, more of what I've been hearing is a concern in the ending over 60 recognized tribes uh, as artists who produce great works of art. And uh, of course, these are the state recognized tribes I'm speaking of. Another massive concern of mine since I'm uh, not only one of the few Native Americans who makes Native American flutes uh, as historical as humanly possible uh, is actually another piece of the legislation that I read on the Department of Interior's website, which was allowing non-Indian labor to work on Indian-made products. Being a Native American flute maker, this is something that I have to deal with on a regular basis. There are countless federal Indians that sell Chinese-made Native American flutes and it is incredibly infuriating for me as well as Indian artists. Allowing the Hawaiians to be protected is a no-brainer. They're an indigenous people, although I don't know how you're going to determine uh, what uh, percentage of Hawaiian blood ancestry or whatever you're going to need to make them state, federal, or whatever other type of uh, organization you need to put them in. So that's of great concern to me. And it uh, really does make me think that this is more an attempt to end state-recognized tribe artwork. So, thank you for listening. Thank you. Ms. Jessalyn Kazaya, would you please unmute and proceed with your comments? Thank you so much for the chance to speak. My name is Jessalyn Kazaya. I am a member of the Oxendine family and an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. I'm also serving here as the new executive director for the Triangle Native American Society. Thank you for Ms. Wanda for speaking and representing earlier. I'm glad to see so many of my esteemed people from North Carolina who have held deep respect for years for your leadership. So I just want to say that we are not in favor of these changes that promote discrimination, that promote exclusion from some of our very uh, real state recognized tribes who may not have had the resources or opportunity to make it through the federal recognition process. My tribe, as Ms. Wanda uh, spoke earlier, was 
recognized as Native and then denied um, rights terminated in the same piece of legislation. So we also have to look at this painful history of termination, right, and also recognize that these are not our processes. These are not our traditional processes. Our sovereignty is inherent. Our identity comes from our ties to the land, our ties to each other, our kinship. These are our values. And so I want to pull us back into our values as Indigenous people. Um, my culture and identity come from my community that I have been born and raised in, right? Recognizing that I, my people have been here forever. This is the land that we know. Um, this is everything that we know. So I'm looking at how legislation is being used against us. This is not a new story. There's a long history of trying to legislate us out of existence, right? What's happening here is lateral violence. I've heard some really hateful comments from people who, to me, that doesn't feel like Native values. What I was taught was being in good relationship, being taking care of all our relations, recognizing all our relations. That is ours. That's our values. Our culture and tradition come out of these values, right? I will be making pottery from the same clay that my family has been using, right? The same plant materials that we've always been in relationship with. We are people of the pines. Um, I hope that my descendants, their children, their great-grandchildren will continue these traditions. That's what makes us who, us who we are. Legislation should be a tool to help shape a better world. And when we're using that as a tool against people, um, it begins to create some problems. Now, I'm also going to recognize that when we're speaking against people who are incorporating as a nonprofit without genealogy, that's also a very different situation than what we're speaking about. And I appreciate um, Mr. Greg Richardson for speaking on how North Carolina does have a very specific process for recognizing um, our state recognized tribes. And that's very documented and vetted, right? So we can't use this broad stroke swath across the board because we are going to be hurting some of our family, our kin, right? Our relations, all our relations. So I just want to bring us back to our core values of being in right relationship and find ways forward that are based on those values. Thank you. Thank you. Elk Richardson, are you on the line? Please let me to proceed with your comments. Okay, let's move along. Dr. Cavalier, if you're ready to speak, go ahead and unmute and proceed. Thank you so much, Mikuhuk. My name is Crystal Cavalier, Dr. Crystal Cavalier. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Okanichi Band of the Spotty Nation, but I'm here representing my nonprofit, uh, Seven Directions of Service. Um, I'd like to thank Greg Richardson for speaking. I also want to know that the, or tell you that the exclusion of state recognized tribes in this type of legislation will violate the state's ability to maintain their own government-to-government -government relationships with our tribes in North Carolina. And such government-to-government -government relationships are created through legislation by the state, and the Commission of Indian Affairs has an extensive process that they go through to make sure that we can tie our genealogy back to the first contact that we were, happened, you know, 531 years ago. And this process is important in many states to recognize the contribution of all tribes within their borders. In managing these relationships, it is understood um, that the sales of artwork within the boundaries of the state is an important source of income for many state-recognized indigenous artists, which are on this call today. And the state has the authority to govern such commerce, commerce and ensure that individuals wishing to honor their heritage may purchase indigenous art with confidence. In all of the communities that I work with in North Carolina, we have not um, made any art that is not our own, that comes from our community on the East Coast. Um, I do appreciate the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs for providing this opportunity to allowing us to speak on this. And um, thank you so much, Alewa. Thank you for those comments. Again, the floor is wide open. If you would like to jump in on the discussion using the WebEx meeting window, please use the raise hand feature and wait to be called upon and recognized. If you've dialed in and you would like to be recognized, please text 202-308-2297 and we'll get you in the queue. Thank you. And as a reminder, 
This listening session is being live streamed and a transcript will be included in the official committee record and that includes comments made using the chat feature. Please ensure comments are appropriate and respectful and limited to the Artist Act discussion draft. Thank you. Um, hi, my hand is raised. Can I go ahead and speak? Just a moment, please. Unless you want to do it twice. Are there any new callers who would like to be recognized? One last call for any new callers who would like to provide a comment. With that, uh, we're at a stopping point. I want to thank everyone who provided comments and who joined us to listen in. This has been a very productive session. We appreciate your time and energy. As you review your comments and suggestions, staff may follow up directly. As a reminder, we'll be accepting written comments until May 19th at artist at indian.senate.gov. That's artist at indian.senate.gov. Thank you and have a good evening.